Hi, I'm Shane. A few weeks ago, possibly a few too many weeks ago, and apologies to anybody that I promised this video to, um, I went to the Battle Group South War Games Expo Day show convention thing at the Bovington Tank Museum in uh, Bovington. Um, this is a war game show in a museum full of tanks. There is basically no two ways about that. It is a fantastic experience, just, um, it, it's a working museum, so there are people wandering around, but amongst all the millions and millions of tanks, which range from the World War I first tank ever things that are divided into male and female for reasons I can't ascertain, to um, modern Afghanistan stuff like the Viking, um, in between all of that there's war games of all varieties going on and, and stalls selling war games things. Um, participation games that you can join in, demonstration games, huge elaborate games, people um, and clubs put you know spend their whole year building up to this and, and, and put on fantastic games. Um, as you'll see from some of the interviews that I managed to get, um, you, you know people are, they really know their history, that they have done their homework, they've made fantastic tables, painted up a lot of miniatures. Um, a really excellent event, um, lots of fun. Um, so, uh, on my student budget, uh, as you do at these things, I, I bought a few things, um, as well as trying to get some interviews with people, which actually takes a lot longer than I expected, and because I was relying on somebody for a lift, um, I was only there for part of one day, even though it's a weekend long event, so I only managed to get interviews with about four people, and coincidentally mostly about uh, World War II games that were running, but there, um, there is all manner of games being played at this, from science fiction to ancient historical stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things that I bought, even though they're just cheap and crap, um, but they're interesting to me, and I'll intersperse that with the interviews that I got. So I'm going to start off with fake plastic trees. Um, where are we? These um, palm trees. I'm uh, starting to run a little campaign for some guys in my class who aren't really war gamers but really like the idea of it. Um, a modern thing where the Arab Spring comes to a little desert island and uh, the local Royal Navy frigate that happens to be in the area sends in the marines to try and reinstall the corrupt government that gets overthrown. Um, so while I do have a collection of uh, modern Afghanistan stuff I was looking to, to branch it out a bit um, and trees are hard to come by in any kind of quantity or quality. Um, the model railway stuff is actually pretty ugly and, and crap and not very robust um, and anything else tends to be kids toys or, or very expensive so I was delighted to find these for um, 10 for 250 um, little plastic um, uh, palm trees uh, multi-layered very robust so I can portable them around the place which is unfortunately how I get to most of my games and I have to bring my stuff with me um, the trunk is modeled so I just need to put a bit of a wash on it I think um, they had a knobble on the end but I've cut that off and I'm drilling holes so a clever idea that I and possibly everybody else in the world has had is to um, mount an upturned thumbtack on a penny, which I'm assured is perfectly legal if the Queen's head is up or down or doesn't have stuff stuck to it or does have stuff stuck to it or whatever. Um, so this allows me to mount them down the middle of a road or along the side of a road or in an orchard or just scattered about the table however I want. Um, and um, I'm going to put a bit of sand on the base with glue, sand being readily available, also perfectly legally, from my local beach. We're here doing the demonstration game of Battle Group Overlord using the Battle Group World War II set of rules. This isn't awkward at all. <laughs> and um, uh, the demonstration game is for the British attack across the Odon River at Gavros and the 10th SS Panzer counter attack. So I'll stop for mortars. So far, I think we're about halfway through the game, we've been playing a couple of hours, on and off, with disturbances. And, uh, yeah, sorry about the disturbances. <laughs> no, yeah. and, uh, and as you can see, the, the British attack is closing in on the German main line of resistance. Um, so far, I'd say the game is close. Useless. Most interesting thing that's happened. Oh, the most interesting thing that's happened. Um, the appalling British morale and the removal of its pinning tokens at the end of last turn. Uh, Don't roll the one, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. The, the vaunted SS Panzer crew who upped and ran off from their tank at the first sign of uh, British shelling. And the flamethrowing crocodile tank's lack of ability to spot the target. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> 
<laughs> when it's about to target, it'll be bad. Yeah. <laughs> Rigid inflatable hold boats. Rib. Um, like a little zodiac kind of a thing. This will be fantastic for my um, island invasion campaign. Uh, if I want to have the marines doing a beach landing or anything like that, coming in through the surf with the insurgents firing at them, uh, or even just to have scattered around um, at a landing site as a bit of scenery. Um, a quid each. Came to pack of three. Uh, resin and easily painted, I expect. No engines. Pity, but hardly a deal breaker. Um, Pretty happy with these. This is the kind of thing I was buying. It was just spend a few quid on something interesting here and there. Um, it's slightly less than a set of World War II rules called um, Battlefront, and we enjoy things. So they're they're very historically accurate, and they, they seem to play out really well. Um, and they yeah they, they they reward you for good tactics, getting your artillery and your infantry and your armor all combined properly, and they really badly punish you for getting your tactics wrong. And they're, they're horrifically complicated. Then no, they're not. They're, they, they're, they're based on a system called Fire and Fury, which is written for yeah. American Civil War. Right. So they're like the Fire and Fury rules lifted through into you know, World War II and modern era. Um, they're probably meant to be played on battalion level, but we like to t take the opportunity, you know, once a year of putting on a mega game. Right. So this is a brigade level game, and effectively it plays out as three mini battles all linked together. Um, so what this is, this is a slightly unusual battle in Normandy, in that it's actually the Brits on the receiving end of a quite heavy German attack. Uh, with a lot of armour, um, trying to pinch out a bridgehead where the British had thrown an infantry brigade across the River Orme. It's playing out pretty close to history, and the, the, the Germans have been grinding their way through the villages, um, but you know, not, not making quick enough progress and starting to run into heavier and heavier British artillery. All oh, right. And as you know, as often happens, it's actually the, it's the fact they're running out of Panzer Grenadiers which is slowing the advance down. Um, Force them back to the sea. Yeah. It, it, well, they've got the backs to the river. There's a river down there, and. Um, with a, what, what happened basically is the British infantry were coming, advancing south of Conn, and the Germans looked, regarded the River Orne with its really steep valleys as a really safe anchor for the west flank. But the Brits found an undefended bridge. It was damaged, but they pushed an infantry brigade across and very quickly put up a Bailey bridge and okay. took some armour across. And in the middle, in the middle, I've, he's, he's, he's got. A... And suddenly, the Germans found this reinforced infantry brigade in their rear, and the order went out to do something about it. And the only available force was the um, tank battalion from 12th SS with a couple of battalions of Panzer Grenadiers. So they've launched a counter-attack. Unfortunately, the, uh, the German CO got killed fairly early on in the battle yesterday. The, the, the German CO in history, it was a, <laughs> a bloke called Max Wunsch, who was an absolute you know, die-hard Nazi from LSAH, who was the tank commander in 12th SS. And he, he always used to lead from the front, and that's what he was doing yesterday. His command, Panther, was pushing right forwards with the... Uh, pretty well the first wave and he got close assaulted in, a, in an orchard by a British company commander and knocked out. So uh, that, that's probably <laughs> about the best victory the Brits have had so far. Yeah, I think somebody's getting a medal for that one. Yeah. So it's got commander, we've got super tanks, so we'll take them. Uh, uh, zero minus one. That's one. This actually is one of the one of the few VC actions in Normandy. Yeah. There was only five British VCs or, um, awarded to the British and Commonwealth troops in Normandy, and one of them was in this battle. And it was to a British forward observer, who, um, as the Germans were closing in on the bridge, he he was you know sat there in the middle of an absolute maelstrom of fire, calling in artillery, calling in artillery, and you know he he. Uh, he pretty well single-handedly is responsible for uh, for blunting the German attack. Okay. So has the artillery fire been going in this game? 
comparatively? Um, well, at the moment, the, the Brits have still only got their field regiments because the Germans haven't got close enough to threaten the bridges themselves. But as, as they close in on the bridges, they'll start to get the medium regiments. And then if they really start to get close into the, the bridges, you get agras, which is heavy, heavy regiments dropping down, um, you know, massive concentrations. And if there are any German infantry left at that point, they ain't going to get through it. So I think it's pro probably like the, the real one. It's probably going to end in a, in a fairly bloody stalemate. Skips. A bin by any other name would smell as sweet. Uh, these are just little resin skips full of rubbish and building materials and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think making rubbish is really hard actually. You have to make all kinds of tiny bits that look like real bits. Um, much easier to buy it pre-modelled. Throw a couple of colours on there so you can tell the galvanised iron from the girders from the tyres and um, whatever else is in there. Um, I think stuff like this can look really good if um, if you're good at painting that sort of drippy rust effect, which I've never even tried, so um, I'm not expecting to be great at that, but better to have my first attempt on, on a bin than on a tank, I think. Um, and I seem to have only got two of these, but uh, really, how many skips does one person need? Thanks. So what are, what are we playing? Hey, it's a Fire Force Rhodesia 1977-78, so, uh, set in the, um, the bush wars in, in Rhodesia. We're doing uh, drops to go and get terrorists, uh, find terrorists. And Freedom support. fighters. Well, <laughs> they called them terrorists at the time. They called them ters. So we've sort of just uh, um, at the time that's how they were seen by oh, yeah. the the Rhodesian light infantry we were fighting. We have got some parachute drops and the parachutes do actually work. Let's go with that. Excellent. Oh, that's gonna hurt. Yes. <laughs> um, and we have various pieces of kit that are. Especially actually, yes, built. yes, he has just actually landed on an actual crocodile. Can you grab the link? We've got some scratch built stuff. The, the terrain was, was scratch built. This hmm. you cannot get, you cannot get one of those. That was scratch built by Ian, who's not here. Oh. Uh, it is ground support and um, spotting aircraft. Excellent. Um, and various modifications done to the helicopters were done by members of the group. Ah. Cast Cast the figures. And Actually, let me get the probably focused on that. Yeah, door gunner. That's fantastic. So those bits were cut and made and then cast. And we have one K car with the 20 mil cannon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. So um. What are we talking about in terms of the mission here? How is this working? Well, this is just finished. We're just about to restart. This oh, is a participation game. We did win best participation game. We won it in 2017. And we put it on again this year for, and we won the best participation game. We only done one game today. We did 11 yesterday. Holy cow. So we're just about to start another game. Um, but we, we're oh, using Dave rules and Dave, Dave made them up. Dave's not here just at the minute. I think he's, he's actually over in the minicar stand ah. serving people, which is strange. Um, but yes, we used our own set of rules with dice um, to see how far you um, could see and shoot and, and stuff. And it seems to, we've got through, as I say, 11 games yesterday, which is what, half an hour a game sort of thing. Hmm. Bit of fun. Yeah. Nice table too. Many Thank teddy bears died to make this yes, table. Yes, indeed. Our first foray into teddy bear met for <laughs> Uh, I was at a stand, uh, the Square, which um, makes some excellent resin stuff for very cheap. Um, I got a lot of their, their buildings um, and have painted up every single one of them, in fact, in their Mogadishu line, which works really well for any Middle East or um, something a stand kind of setting. Um, now, at Salute, which is the biggest war games expo in possibly the world, um, which is in London, uh, God, the scale of this thing is just insane. Um, but at their uh, bring and buy stand, I had used my eel eyes to spot. Um, some lovely, lovely palm trees. Um, palm trees being some, well, trees of any kind being something that, uh, to my dismay, somebody pointed out that um, war games trees are always way out of scale because real trees are very, very tall compared to a person. So now, whenever I see a war games soldier standing beside a war games or model railway tree, I'm always disappointed because um, it's only a few inches tall and, and that's rubbish. So I've been looking for something huge and I certainly got some beautiful, huge trees here. Um, these are made of etched brass and I think possibly handmade by some person. Um, but uh, they've only got a wire uh, 
piece coming out at the end of them, so I wasn't sure how to mount them, so I asked the guy at the stand if he had any ideas. And uh, after a bit of a rummage, yeah, I just got some ordinary flat um, resin bases, sort of textured sand, but um, hopefully if I can bend the wire around, is what he was suggesting. Um, I do have, I think, some here, some two-part epoxy, which I was going to use for some scuba diving stuff. Frankly, if I'm going to trust my life to it, I'm going to happily trust my palm trees to it, even though I really, really like my palm trees. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just hoping that that will be a simple and quick solution to the problem that I was having. Between the 7th and 12th of June 1944, we're representing the first Canadian parachute battalion, which we're holding the crossroads. Uh, 7th of June, they moved down from uh, the uh, battery up at uh, up in northern France. Uh, to take the crossroads as part of three para brigades um, um, uh, orders, right. um, the it was they got attacked by the 716th um, Infantry Battalion uh, by the Germans, uh, which they held off, and then later on the day they got supplies up from uh, Sixth Airborne Division, which landed near Ranville with the um, light 75 mm uh, artillery and six pounders. Uh, the the, then the 346 Infantry uh, Division moved down from Le Havre on about the 8th, which then brought in heavier, heavier armour for the Germans. Uh, this was held off by um, a cruiser, which I can't remember the name of, um, which hit, uh, stopped the actual account, uh, the attack going in. After that, it, the Germans held back, but sent a lot of snipers in to, to try and keep the Canadians at bay. All right. Yeah. So okay, well, um, this is bold action, so you're not talking about divisions here, we're uh, yeah. talking about individual yeah, dudes, right? Yeah, yeah, um, So, So, what part of that whole engagement are we playing here on this table? We're actually playing the actual crossroads. So you have, um, I think it was C Company of the uh, 1st Canadians and the 878th Battalion of, for the German, which was part of 346th Infantry Division. Yeah, oh, they're my other. I'll have So, how's it been going? Yeah, fine. I mean, it's gone fairly uh, much to plan. The Canadians are holding off the Germans with aggressive tactics, as you can see here. Uh, the Canadians are coming round to, to go, try and get into the back of the Germans. I we'll hope they've got mortar teams in the brickworks. The farmhouse over there is 3 para Brigade headquarters. Uh, and you've, what happened was you had pockets, not a continuous line, because oh, yeah. I, this, down on this road is back going down to Bois de Bavan, where um, eight para brigade, uh, eight para battalion was, mm -hmm. and towards that area was Brevel, where nine uh, para battalion was. So there was continuous pockets. Uh, what happened was that the Germans had Brevel. So what what is happening? The Germans are coming from Brevel towards. Um, the La Maisonelle crossroads to try and uh, break the crossroads because this was a main, major junction. Because further down there, that on the road to Herovalet, was a slope down in the open area where 6th Airborne Division had landed. So if the Germans could take this crossroads and push their armour through, they would get into the back rear and head towards Randville and the bridges. Okay, okay. so pivotal for the whole, yeah. the yeah. whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, and what happened in history? History, the... Um, the not, uh, First Canadian Par Parachute Regiment. They held held off the Germans. Okay. Until you, we had um, on about the 10th of uh, June, uh, 51st Harlan Division came up with eight Black Watch, attacked Breville, coming through here, up to Breville, and uh, they um, they t uh, took that um, the village and held the main ridge. Because all along here was the main ridge, which behind was the landing sites for um, Sixth Airborne. Okay. What? Gosh, that's detailed. Yep. Uh, right, so what, what is the most um, <laughs> unlikely or interesting thing that's happened in this game? Well, in, thi in this game, you've got the attack by the German armour here, which um, we had uh, two, two sections of Canadians there which have been uh, killed. Uh, the house over there with which were the holdings with um, Piers and um, Vickers and machine guns to stop anything coming down that road. That got destroyed. So the Germans are now coming across there to try and cut off the, the to, to come round the flank to take the crossroads. So we're right. trying to hold them off. <laughs> Finally, from the bring and buy stand, which may or may not have been for charity, I'm not sure, but um, 
Certainly it had loads of interesting stuff on it, which uh, which always surprises me, because Wargamers are loads to throw anything away, um, given the amount of unpainted lead they seem to accumulate, uh, which is never going to see a tabletop, so anything to get rid of they must really hate. But a guy who was getting rid of um, a load of board games that he uh, was never going to get around to um, had um, this Andean Abyss, uh, which is the latest game from the makers of my favourite board game of all time, uh, Labyrinth, The War on Terror 2001, question mark. Um, which is a two-player only game. Uh, this one is four players. Um, it's new, I haven't uh, really learned a whole lot about it, um, but um, it's a 60 quid game in sterling and uh, I was going for 30 and in fact because I left it till the end of the day and was out of money, the guy gave it to me for the 27 pounds that I had in my pocket. Um, it's, apart from this um, unsightly sticker on the front, which I can't seem to get off, it's um, in perfect brand new unplayed condition. In fact, the uh, counters are unpunched and uh, the cards are still in their cellophane wrappings. So um, even though I don't have four um, players to, um, to to play it with for the time being, um, until I can find some people I can interest in a somewhat complex card counter based war board game, um, I'm just getting a lot of enjoyment out of, out of owning it. It's my favourite. Uh, Alan was playing yesterday, he wasn't doing right there, is that, is that to, He had two tigers hidden and a company of people. Uh, yeah, well, we play it. It's just a pure trust. Yeah. And then he's oh, getting rid of it. Sorry. No, I haven't done any movement. I haven't, let, I haven't moved from him. I haven't moved any of the cell. All I've done is move this in. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that is it for um, Bovington, um, the Battle Group South. Game War Games Expo um, at Bovington. Um, really, a unique opportunity to uh, play war games and hang around tanks and put your lunch on tanks and uh, and look inside tanks and stuff like that um, all at the same time. Makes for great atmosphere. It's a uh, um, it's a lot of fun. So if you are um, in the south of England sometime during June or July or whenever that is on, I highly recommend that you get down to it because um, it's a good day. Thank you for watching and goodbye.